pray everyone's well today. Come ready to praise the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. He's worthy. Come on, let's pray and we're going to jump right into worship. Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for uh, inhabiting our praise today, God. We thank you for showing up today. You're faithful to do so. We just ask you, God, to have your way in this place. Lord, we lift up holy hands to you right now. And we just thank you, Father God, that we are redeemed in Jesus' name. Come on, if you've been redeemed in Jesus' name, just lift your hands to heaven and thank the Lord God Almighty. Just let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Come on, I believe it's time that the redeemed of the Lord just say so. I am redeemed. Amen. That don't mean just say so, the word so, but to acknowledge that you are redeemed, that he bought you with a price, and his price was his precious life. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's praise him. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. Say so.
demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, men are on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need, you've got. There's honey in the rock. Come on, somebody needs to testify that this morning. I'm just telling you, church, there's honey in the rock. Oh, yeah, sweetness, I 
at the mercy seat now I've tasted it's not hard to see only you can satisfy this honey in the rock this honey in the rock this honey in the rock Power in the blood, healing in your head Started flowing when you said it is love Everything you did to And I keep praying, and you keep moving. I keep praising, you keep proving. I have all that I need. Yeah, you are all that I need. Come on, declare it. I keep loving, you keep fighting, you keep giving, you keep providing. I have all that I need. Oh yeah, you. I keep praying, you keep moving. I keep praising, you keep proving. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I have all. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. Yeah. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground. There's honey in the rock, purpose in your plan, power in the blood, healing in your head. Started flowing when you said it is done. Everything I need you got. There's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Yes, it is so sweet, Jesus. You're so sweet. So sweet, Jesus, you're so sweet. Praise you, Father. You're so worthy, Lord God, of all that I have and all that I am. Every breath I take is yours, Jesus. Breath. 
coming after me. He's coming after me. And he won't stop. That's right. Come on, brother. in my spirit you know that saying about beggars can't be choosers well you know that's not who we are we do we are not a company of beggars we are a company though who walks in authority yeah. and I just feel like the Lord wants us to break off some things because have you ever felt like you were a beggar have you ever felt like you had to just beg and plead and God if you just do this I'll just serve you forever. And God, if you'll just do that, and if you'll just do this, and if you'll answer that thing. And, but that's not who we are because he's given us authority. You know, we're warriors. Every one of you is a warrior. And warriors don't beg. Warriors command. Warriors speak. That's what warriors do. And so, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, if you need more, if you need that boldness, if you need more of that warrior thing, Father, we just lift our hands to you. Right now, we say impartation, Lord God, for that warrior that you placed within deep within us. And, Father, we ask you to stir the warrior. Father, we ask you to stir the lover within us, Lord, that we love you, Lord God, with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. And, Father God, that you increase that anointing and that authority, Lord, increase that Holy Ghost boldness to begin to move out and do all that you have called us to do. Father, I thank you that you have called this people as a warrior. This is an army that you're building. You're not building, an, you're not building beggars. You're not building a company of beggars. You're building a company of warriors, kingdom warriors. And we call that forth now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we step in this day, God. We step in even more so to the cadence of heaven. To the cadence of heaven. So, Lord, we say, said and done. Amen doesn't mean, God, I hope so. It means, so be it. So we say, amen, so be it. So be it. I said, so be it. In Jesus' name. Chasing me. He's chasing me down. He's chasing me down. Chasing, coming after me. And he won't stop me. Hey. Do you believe it? He's coming out. Stop. Oh, my 
I can be real with you. Say anything and not be afraid. You made me and you like what you made. You make me and you don't make mistakes. I can be real with you. Lord, you take me just as I am. You choose me all over again. I am the one you love. I am the one you love. I don't have to prove anything. There's room at your table for me. I am the one you love. I am the one you love. It's me, it's me, oh God, it's me. I'm the one you love. I'm the one. of me Even though I don't deserve it sometimes No, I'm not a perfect child But I still make my father smile I know you're proud of me Take me just as I am. You choose me all over again. I am the one you love. Yeah. I am the one you love. I don't have to prove anything. There's room at your table for me. I am. I am the one you love. I'm the one you love. I am the one. Your love never fails. Your love, your love never fails. Your love never fails. You keep on, you keep on loving me. Your love never fails. Your love never fails. In spite of my wrong, sometimes your love, your love, your love never fails. Your love never fails. Unconditional love. Your love never fails. Your love, your love never fails. Your love never Let's go. Come on. Say. Your love, your love never fails. Your love never fails. You keep on loving me. Your love, your love 
as I am. Yes, God. You choose me all over again. I am the one you love. John is the one that you love. I don't have to prove anything. There's room at your table for me. I am the one you love. desires that you know this morning that he sees you he sees you right where you're at and he sees you right with what you're going through I believe that there are some of you in here and I would I'd just like you to confirm it in your own heart who had a difficult week this week you just had a tough week I had a tough week this week it was a personally I had a really tough week I, I found myself saying over and over why is this so hard why is this so hard and the Lord kept giving me a word over and over again and I hope that this will echo into your heart the way that he touched my heart with it because it really helped how many of you know God will speak to you you just get in a quiet place and he'll speak right to your heart well, this is what he said, and this is what he's, I believe, saying to some of you that are in here this week. Some of you are like, no, I had a great week, man. It was awesome. But for some of you who are in here, it was a bad week. It was a tough week, and I believe the Lord's speaking to you right now. And this is what he's saying. Frustration is not your friend. Determination is your friend. And the Lord says, choose today what you want to do. Do you want frustration or determination, yeah, determination. <laughs> mm. one of those two will lead you to a very productive place both come on through hardship but one will lead you to a very productive place and the other will lead you to a very destructive place choose the productive place this morning you see, the Lord is about to, I'm going to pray for us, and I, I just know that the Lord's about to speak powerfully this morning through Pastor David. It's, we're going to have our world rocked, amen? amen? So I just believe he's about to do something. So Lord, I ask you this morning that as we prepare for this time of tithe and offering and, and an announcement, Lord, that you would move powerfully in our hearts and in our minds to receive from you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, you can be seated all over this place. God is good. Wow, look at the person next to you and say, you look great. Thanks for coming. Yeah. You know, you ought to look back at them and say, if I look that good, take me to Sonny's Real Pit Barbecue after the service now. Praise God. <laughs> Y'all, I, I believe there's a vision. I really do. Do you see this right here? You see that water drop? That represents baptism. 
And do you see that uh, cross there? That represents salvation. You see, when you get saved, you get baptized. And uh, coming up pretty soon, we're going to have baptism. We are. We're going to have baptism here in this house. Some of you are like, I don't need to be baptized. I've already been baptized. No, I believe that your niece is going to get baptized. I believe that your nephew is going to get baptized. I believe that your neighbor is going to get baptized. I believe that your coworker is going to get baptized. I believe that your friend who you thought never would come to Jesus is about to get Woo! baptized. Hallelujah. That's how good our God is. Amen. Well, you say, how do they get baptized? See, I got baptized in church. Do you know why? Someone invited me to church. That's why. And I gave my life to Jesus. And then they gave an invitation for those of us who wanted to be baptized. You see, when you walked in here, you saw a big sign that said, National Back to Church Sunday. Let me clear up any confusion that there might be. You see, our church launch is on September the 18th, our location launch for being here. We're working out bugs still and doing all that. That's why we waited till the 18th. Now, for those of us who attend Lifeway Community Church, this is our location launch. Praise God. And I want to tell you something else, though. For those who have never been to Lifeway Church, they're not as interested in a location launch. But there are a lot of people who stopped going to church back in March of 2020. They quit. They stopped going. There are some who haven't been. There are some who stopped going a long time ago because of some situation, and they'd love to come back. They're just waiting to be invited. So here's what I would like to see that leads to them being baptized. For some, maybe in a, in a way of saying, I never got baptized, but I've just recommitted my life to the Lord, and I'm ready. And for some to say, for the very first time, I'm, I'm getting in the waters of baptism, and I'm giving my life to Christ. Here's how it happens. That sign you saw out front, it looks a lot like this one. And I'd like to ask each of you, I have at the front door waiting for you one of these yard signs. I would love if you would take one with you and put it in your yard or in some strategic location where people can see it. I want them to see this sign. You might say, why do you want them to see that sign? Because I want them to know that they're invited. Now, there's just something I can't do a whole lot about. The writing's kind of small, so we're going to have to put it out on Facebook, too. Amen. <laughs> Please take a picture and explain it on Facebook. When you drive by my house and you see this sign in small writing, they'll look for it. Literally, you'll see cars in your neighborhood slowing down and looking at it. What's on there? And you know what they're going to see over and over again? You belong here. You belong here. Also, you received five of these coming in. So why did I receive five of these coming in? Now, if you're a guest with us, you probably just received one, and we're glad you're here today, and we hope you keep coming back. But this is something I want to tell you. If you attend here regularly, you're a member here, you received five of these. Because what I want you to begin to do right now is to begin to write down five friends that you know do not attend church somewhere else. We Listen, we don't have enough seats, okay? So don't invite people from another church and say, hey, would you just come to our church maybe for one Sunday? We're not looking for, they're already saved. I'm not trying to catch fish that are already in somebody's bucket. <laughs> Amen? I mean, I want you to get out there and set the hook, baby. <laughs> Bring some people into this house who do not know Jesus or they've been running from the Lord. Maybe you have a son who hasn't been in a long time. Maybe you have a daughter that hasn't been in a long time. And they're just hoping for some reason why they could come back. Because they know their life's not where it needs to be. See, they had a tough week too. And they're just hoping you'd invite them. And that's why you have one of these cards. It gives specific instructions and it tells them how to be here. I will guarantee you that if you, each one of you, will take five of these out. We'll see this house more than double filled 
And you say, is it about numbers? No, it's about souls. It's about your niece. It's about your nephew. It's about your friend. It's about your, maybe even you're like me, and it's about your parent giving their life to Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, you know. I just believe that God is moving powerfully. So what I'd like to ask you to do is to begin to invite people to National Back to Church Sunday. That is a thing, by the way. We didn't make it up. (laughs) National Back to Church Sunday on September the 18th to be here. And they're going to enjoy this location launch. Now, in the coming weeks, we'll tell you about all the things that are taking place with that. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, can I tell you something else? And this is the other assignment that I have this morning, and I want to get right to it. Because I'm really looking forward to Pastor David speaking. Amen? I mean, this brother, he's got a word. I missed my pastor today, Pastor Eli. But isn't it good? Amen? (laughs) Don't you miss him? Yeah. How many of you know he is the most awesome mentor, pastor, friend you could have? Amen? He's awesome. We all miss him. But thank God he trusts this house enough to be able to be out and be be with his mother this morning. We thank God for that. But it is also my assignment this morning to receive tithes and offering. And the Lord placed on my heart something that was very important. You know, I've, I've had some discussions with people who aren't familiar with the Bible lately. And I had some people come to me. They, some of them go to church. They're just not that familiar with the Bible. You know, And I had some people tell me, well, tithing is not biblical. Giving the first 10% of your income. They said it's not biblical. I said, well, that's interesting. So we have this dialogue that goes on. I say, actually, it's very biblical. It dates back to uh, Moses wrote about tithing. And when you read in the book of Leviticus, it talks about tithing. And they say, yeah, but. Say, yeah, but. Yeah, but. That's the law. That's under. And we're not under the law anymore. I say, well, actually, it's under the promise. Because if you go back almost 500 years before, you'll see that Abraham tithed. The Bible says that Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. And it wasn't agricultural he was giving the spoils of war look at somebody say that's money (laughs) he gave money okay so it's not just plants and vegetables and things like that that he tithed because I've heard that argument not only that but somehow his grandson got the memo and said Jacob said Lord if you'll do all these things for me surely I will give 10% of my income where did he get that from Tithe means tenth. And he didn't read it in the law of Moses because that's not going to come for another 400 years. So it's under the promise. Then I've had some people say, yeah, but. Say, yeah, but. Yeah, but but that's not for our day. That's for back then. But actually, if you read in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, he says, give of the tithe. Stop robbing me of the tithe. He said, see if I do not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so much that you cannot contain it. And if you believe that's under the curse, you're missing something. Amen? And then they'll say, yeah, but. Say, yeah, but. Yeah, but it's not in the New Testament. The New Testament. It's, you know, I've shown you three places in the Bible, but they'll say it's not in the New Testament. I'll say, oh, okay. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7 actually talks about how Abraham gave of the tithe. As a matter of fact, this, along the same lines of the argument that we get justification by faith. So, we're supposed to tithe. It's biblical. You know what they say to that? Yeah, but. <laughs> I'm serious. I've had people say, yeah, but. And here's, here's, the, here's the bigger. Yeah, but Jesus never said anything about it. <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Because if he did, would you consider it? I mean, like if I could show you where Jesus said you should tithe, would you tithe? I'm not, I'm not, not, uh, where? Does it actually say he did say something? He said, yeah, actually he did. I mean, we're talking red letters, folks, here in the Bible. (laughs) All right, Jesus said we should tithe. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, there it is, mint and dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Usually they say, yeah, but, you know, it says you should have done those, but you shouldn't have neglected the others. I'll say, 
No, it's about justice and mercy. I'll say, no, either way you read that, he's saying you should tithe and not neglect the others. So I just want to challenge you to something today. If you've never tithed, test God in this and see. If he will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so much that you cannot contain it. And say, Lord, I trust you. Can I tell you something? Giving ten, the first 10% of your income is a revelation. You're not going to do it in the natural. But in the supernatural, if you can say, Lord, Jesus, if you said it, and he, the writer of Hebrews said it, and, uh, you know, uh, the patriarch said it, and it's said in the law, and the prophets said it, if they all said it in the Bible, maybe I should consider it. So I would just ask you to pray and ask the Lord if that's what he has for you. Also, we give of the offering. The offering is what he blesses. So we give the first 10% of our income, and then on top of that, we give the offering as the Holy Spirit leads, and we trust in him for that. There are a couple of ways you can give today. You can give online. You can see that up here, or you can give in person right here, or you can bring it down uh, and put it into the basket today. So either you can pull out your cell phone and do that today, or you can give the other way. But trust God in your giving, and watch how much he blesses your life because you are living his will. Can someone say amen? Amen. 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 One other thing, if you're a guest with us today and uh, you're new here, please, we would love to have your guest connection card. And if you could just place that in there, you're the gift today. Praise God. We're so glad you're here. Lord, I ask that you would bless this tithe and offering that we are receiving we know it's already blessed and i ask you lord that you would bless our lives in the giving give us the strength to not just be givers but cheerful givers because we know that you lord love a cheerful giver so come holy spirit and pour out this morning in jesus name amen amen No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It won't work. Say no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Cause God will do what He said He will do if we stand on His word. has any feel free to come on up and we're going to go ahead and start talking for just a moment we've got something we feel like we're supposed to do today that's a little different can y'all give us grace on time just a little bit all right i appreciate that for those of you most of you know this but those of you don't this is my wife Teresa. we uh yay she's the better half of this team we've been partners we'll be in december for 40 years this coming december so we've been, wherever you see one, you generally see the other. We do most everything together, and we minister together, and we do a lot of different things together. And so today, we just felt like that we wanted to start doing something that we've not done. We've done in other places, but we've been here for four years. We've never done this exactly, what we're going to do today. So what we felt like to do, we, we wanted to minister a couple of prophetic words to a few people today before we get started with the word. So we're just going to do that. Y'all just be, those of you, just be praying. You know, we want to stir the Spirit of God. But we just felt like that, you know, this is a house of the prophetic. This is a prophetic house. It's an apostolic house. But we want to stir that. We want to cultivate that. And so we want to begin doing that today because we just want to give two or three words. We're not going to take a lot of time. We just want to begin to, to initiate that. You know, God's moving this house into some new things. And he's expanding things. 
He said, one of the things that we're going to see is we're going to begin to see more gifting come out and being expressed. He said, we want to begin to, to stir the gift of prophecy in this house to a new level. So, Idris, Idris would you please stand, please? Idris, I just heard the Lord saying that, that you have been through thick and thin, and that many times when you've been served lemons, you've had to make lemonade. And the Lord says, daughter, you've not been called just to be one to have to squeeze lemons all the time. He says, but you're going to enter into a new season where you can set aside the lemon squeezer, and you're going to begin to see new fruit coming forth. And he says, and where there's been a time and a place that you've always put others before you, and you've been one to serve, and you've served, and you've served, and it felt like you've cried out to the Lord, Lord, when is it going to be my time? When is my time to do the things that are in my heart? And the Lord says, daughter, it's time. He says he's going to begin to open doors for you. He's going to begin to open windows for you. And you're going to begin to see some opportunities come that you've not had before. And the Lord says he's pleased with your attitude. He's pleased with your heart. Because you've been one that you've stood in silence. You've stood at his feet and worshipped him. But he wants to lift your head now. He says, look at me because we've got work to do. And he says, I've got things for you to do. And I'm going to begin to release. There's much gifting within you. The Lord says, you know that. But it's time for that gifting to begin to be stirred and that gifting to be released. And the Lord is saying it's this day and this hour that he's going to begin to do that. He says, so watch for those opportunities. Don't shrink back from any place that I say, here's a place. He says, step into it freely and know that I'm going to blossom the latter years more than what the first years were, says the Lord. And Edris, um just have a little bit more that the I feel like the Lord wants you to know that he's going to give you some keys and he's going to give you keys because you're a prayer warrior and the Lord says he's going to give you keys that go right into the lock into people's hearts that open them up to the kingdom and open them up to the king and so we call in those keys in Jesus name and we just stir up that gifting that's deep within you because the Lord says, I'm going to use you, and I'm going to bring some people around you and even build some teams around you so that you can pour out. And the Lord says, there's some places I'm taking you to that you never thought you were going to go. But the Lord says, I'm going to take you to those places because I am going to open those doors and that you're going to know which doors to walk through. Because the Lord says, it, it is a pivotal time in your life. It's a pivotal time in the kingdom, but it's pivotal in your life. There's some family members that the Lord says, I'm dealing with that. You, I'm dealing with that. And so we call that in. Whatever that answer is, we call it in now in Jesus' name. There's some bright lights up here. Um, is it Gina? Yeah. Will you mind standing? I just felt like the Lord is saying that. And I know this sounds trite. I mean, it sounds religious, maybe. But the Lord wants you to know that he loves you. That he looks forward to the time that you spend with him. That he looks forward to that. That he likes, walk he likes walking with you. <laughs> he likes talking to you. And the Lord says, there may have been some words said and some things done and some things said that we just break off that, that stuff. Because that's just enemy chatter. So we break that off in Jesus' name. But the Lord wants you to know that he loves you. That he holds you in his heart. That he looks forward to those times with you. And so, Father, I just thank you for an increase right now in that intimate place. The Lord wants you to know you can trust him. He's taken you to a new level, a new place. And you can trust him in the new place. Because you've been in a place that was... At times felt a little bit shaky, but the Lord says, even in the midst of the shaking, I am causing you to stand on a solid rock and that you can trust me. You can trust me in all those situations. There's a lot of situations, but the Lord says you can trust him because he has heard you. There's times that other people don't seem to hear what you're saying, but the Lord says he hears you. And he takes note when you speak. Thank you. Teresa, if you mind standing. I just heard the Lord saying, the storm is over. 
The storm is over and you can breathe. The Lord says you've weathered the storm well and you've been an anchor for others to hold on to. But the Lord says he wants you to know that he's your anchor. And you know that. But he wants to reassure you that you've not lost anything in the storm. Nothing went overboard. Nothing was lost. He's saying that it was a tough season. He says, but out of it is going to come very much good fruit. And even in the place of your daughter and your son, you're, he's saying, you're going to begin to see a quick turnaround on some things. And where there's been uh, an attack and where there's been an oppression and where there's been a fight, the Lord says, he is turning the tide today. He says, this storm has been meant to destroy your family. But the Lord says, it's not going to destroy your family. It's building you up stronger than you've ever been before. And even some places where there's still some lingering things that we're still dealing with, the Lord says, don't give up because I have come to make things right. And he says, I have come on your behalf, and I am shifting the tide in toward your direction. He says, the winds will begin to blow in a new way for you, and you're going to begin to see things that used to be a struggle and used to be a weight. It felt like you had a weight hanging on your back that you just drug with you every day because it was the burden that you were given to carry. The Lord says he's cutting that off of you now. And you're going to begin to see that you are going to have fresh joy come in your house. There's going to be fresh healing come in your house. And the Lord says that he is moving on your family's behalf. And to even today, you'll begin to see there's a shift and a change in the atmosphere because he is on the move. Lord. Am I on now? Okay. You know, we have, Teresa and I, we have done, we have ministered at different places, and, and we have stood and ministered that way for hours at a time, and, and, and I'm, I believe that we're going to see, this seems real loud to me, I don't know how it sounds to y'all, but but we're going to see God begin to move in some new ways. There's people out here that can minister prophetically. And we are going to begin to see that God's going to begin to stir that up. Because he wants to bring a release to people. And he wants to bring an activation to gifts. And one of the ways he does that is he imparts a prophetic word. And it's like a catalyst that begins to go inside of a person. And it ignites birth. And it ignites what's in you to begin to grow and to come forth. So I just encourage you. To embrace we're hearing from God yourself you all hear from God but we're going to begin to embrace I believe to see a new release of the prophetic in this house amen, amen. all right I'm gonna do my best to get you out on time but give me grace if I don't quite make it right on the line but um so the title today is need help just ask if you need help just ask do we need help sometimes yeah, we all need help sometimes, don't we? Some, in some way, we need some kind of help, different kinds of help. So really, that's not a question, is it? It's not a question, do we need help? We all need help, some way, sometimes, somehow. The real question is, who do we go to for help? Where do we go for help? Who do we look to for help? Who do we ask? You know, we can ask for help in a lot of different ways. You know, we've got a lot of things that we, have, we might need help on. We might have a business decision that we need help on. We might need to overcome an addiction that we need some help on. We might have marriage issues that we need some help on. We might have some wrong desires or wrong thoughts that we need help on to get past, to get over. We may have some physical issues or some sickness in our body that we need help. Sometimes we might need help in our finances. We, we're, we learned a key today about the finances, but sometimes we still need help. Sometimes we're making potentially life-changing decisions, and we need help in making the right decision. You don't want to make the wrong decision, but sometimes we need help making the right decision. We need help sometimes with a wounded heart. Sometimes with fear. Fear of the unknown or fear of what we do know. Sometimes we need help with depression, with anger, disappointment, with loss. We all deal with different things that sometimes we need help. The truth is, we always need help with them. 
You know, there's lots of people to help. There are a lot of people. We've got spouses. We've got pastors. We've got friends. We've got counselors. We've got marriage counselors. We've got business consultants. We've got financial advisors. We've got doctors and lawyers. It's unending how many people there are out there that can help us. But is that who we need to, is that who our first call is to? Is that who our first call is to? God can use them all mightily. And he does use many people, those different ways, mightily. But where does our help come from? Oh, and I forgot. I named all the different people that can help make our decisions. But I forgot somebody. You and me. Don't we tend to sometimes make our own decisions without consulting anybody? Don't we sometimes just to say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm intelligent, I'm smart, I'm independent, I can make this decision. And sometimes we don't even realize we need help making a decision, but we do. You know, the truth is, I'm a fixer. My wife can tell you, if she starts talking to me about something, before she finishes her sentences, it's on my mind already what I need to do to fix it. And sometimes she'll say, Hold on. I'm not asking you to fix anything. <laughs> I just want to talk about it. But in my mind, that's just how I'm, I'm built. Is as soon as she starts telling me this is the issue, I try to start fixing it. I keep thinking how to fix it. We often don't know the answer to the issues and problems that we face. But we would have already fixed them, wouldn't we? The things that you've got going on in your life, if you knew today exactly this is what I've got to do to fix it, wouldn't you have already done so? We all would. So we obviously we need some help to um, fix the issues in our lives. There's an old movie. I actually never saw the movie, and some of you will laugh at that. I actually never saw this movie, but everybody in this room, I, maybe except for a few of the younger people, are going to know this phrase. So when we have a problem, when we have an issue, who are you going to call? <laughs> We're not going to call Ghostbusters. We're going to call the Holy Ghost. We're going to call the Holy Ghost to come and help us, to give us a helping hand. You know, and the truth is, we all know the, the answer to the question, where does our help come from? We can all say it. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord. That's right. We all know that answer. Let's look at Psalms 121. I'm going to read it to you. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and of earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over us, watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon at night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and he, over your going, both now and forevermore. The Lord is the one that we have to look to for our help. He's the, he is the truth and he is the way, and we've got to seek him to find that way, to find the answers that we need. As a Christian, for years, quite honestly, I felt like if you'd asked me, do you depend on the Lord? Yes, I depend on the Lord. I trust the Lord, and I depend on the Lord. But in reality, God had showed me different times in my life, quite honestly, who's the first person I depended on? I depended on David Jones. I was the first person that I relied on. I was the first person I asked the questions of. I'm the first person that gave the answers. You know, I knew the Lord was there. But, you know, sometimes we can say we trust the Lord. Sometimes and we do trust the Lord to the degree that we do. But sometimes we don't recognize that he's not the first person that we trust. You know, and um, you say, well, you know, you love God. You've lived for God. Yes, I have. But you know, like I said earlier, my personality type, the kind of person I am, I'm kind of an independent person. I'm kind of a self-reliant, hard-working person. And I've always been a little bit like, and I'm not saying this is good, 
have always been a little bit like, well, God's there if I can't work it out myself. Because, you know, that, that verse in the Bible that's not really in the Bible, God helps those who help themselves. You know, that's not in the Bible if you don't know that. It's not in there. But it's a good motto, maybe, but it can get us off if we need to be trusting the Lord. Because we've got to trust him first because he sees things we don't see. And sometimes that independence, that self-reliance that we all kind of sometimes, you know, we think it's a good thing. Sometimes it can go by another word. It can go by pride. You know, sometimes we can have pride in that we're self-reliant, we're independent, that we can do it. We don't need anybody to do it. But pride is just, independence is just pride wrapped up in a prettier package. Because we need to rely on the Lord, and we need to rely on each other. You know, I realized about seven years ago, I went through something that I realized that God began to show me, you haven't been totally relying on me. And I'm going to just tell you a little story right quick. Seven years ago next week, my father died. And I was one that from 10 years old, I worked every summer my grandfather's farm. I saved my money. I bought my own school clothes from 10 years old up through forever. I've always been independent. I've always not looked to people to help me. I've never gone, the only time, quite honestly, you know, um, after my wife and I got married during college, the only time that I ever sought help, we, we got married, we told our parents we're getting married at Thanksgiving. We got married at Christmas. You know, <laughs> we gave a lot of notice. That was in 1982. But we basically paid for everything ourselves, and um, Teresa had a car, and I had a car. We were going to different colleges, and during that time, we transferred her to my college. We sold her car, and we used the money, quite honestly, to help pay for the wedding, to, to do the things that we needed to do. And so we go off to Georgia Southern after Christmas, after the first of the year. We're in our third year of college, and um, we live in this cute little house brought behind McDonald's, decorated in antiques. It came furnished. You know, it was so cute. And we didn't have enough money to buy a combo meal at McDonald's. I mean, literally, we couldn't. I mean, I worked for, I had two part-time jobs. I worked for the schools, the college, as a coordinator of food services. And I hired all the students. So as soon as she came to school, who do you think I hired? I hired her, too. And she ran this cute little cafe, and she was a cashier. And I would go sit up there and talk to her when she was working when I wasn't. But we didn't have a lot of money. We were going to school. And um, during the first six months we were married, we had that one car, and guess what happened? It broke down. It broke that bad. And we got, we can't, we're too far away from the campus to walk. We could, I guess, but, you know, we weren't fit for that. And um, so anyway, we, I called my dad, and my mom and dad came up and brought us a car to use. And, and quite honestly, we didn't have the money to pay to get the car repaired. And anyway, my dad paid for the car to get repaired, and then we got his car back to him. After that, quite honestly, I've always tended to a little bit be, I'm trying, we're, for Teresa and I, we tend to have taken care of our parents, even at a young age, helping them and doing things for them. And um, so I never really was dependent on my dad for counsel, for advice, for financial help or anything. But when he died, something happened in me. Teresa and I are partners in everything. But... I always kind of felt like I'm the, I'm the provider. I'm the provider in, for, for her and my family. I'm the one that they look to. So I've got people that look to me. And our parents, quite honestly, kind of look to us. And so something happened after he died is that I realized that I'd always, I realized at that point that I always had seen, God, I depend on you. But in my heart, I always had a safety net. My dad didn't have much money, but if I had really and truly needed something, he would have done what he could to have helped me. But for the first time in my life, I realized I'm walking the trapeze of life now without anybody's net underneath me. And that kind of shook me up, and it kind of has caused me, it caused me to realize I've got to depend solely on God 
for the first time in a way that I didn't realize that I didn't already do that. And so we've got to realize that even if you have a safety net, even if you've got all the support and everything else, the most important thing is that we depend on God first, no matter what. Because a safety net can be removed at any time. We don't really have a safety net. It's God or nothing. God is the one that we've got to look to. I realized during that time that really, that I lacked faith in God. And you know, it was there at that time that I realized that I had believed the big lie. That, um, that I didn't believe that God would really come through for me sometimes. That he wouldn't always come through for me. That I had to depend on myself. And I believe that lie. You know, it's that big lie that the enemy uses to entice all of us. And he's been doing it for a long, long time. He comes and he plants a seed and he says, you know, God's not really going to do that for you. God's not going to come through for you and whatever the situation is, whatever your problem is, whatever your issue is. You know, that lie comes and says, he's not going to heal you. He's not going to bring those finances. He's not going to work in those children. He's not going to do this or that, whatever the thing is. He comes with that big lie. You know, and then I began to think, why don't we think that God won't come through every time? Why do we think that way? Part of the reason is the way we're wired. We don't like to wait on God. Who likes to wait? Nobody likes to wait. But God uses waiting to work things in us. We don't like his answer sometimes, quite honestly. Sometimes he's giving us answers, and we're like, I don't recognize that. That can't be you. That cannot be you. I don't want to hear that. Woo, woo, woo. I don't want to hear that. Because we don't like what the answer is. Sometimes we're moved by fear. We're afraid of what he might ask of us. You know, the truth is, sometimes we judge God based on our circumstances. And we can't see the big picture that he knows and that he sees but we're supposed to trust him that he does see the big picture. And we might not understand the circumstances, but sometimes we get in those situations and we begin to judge him based on our circumstances. We don't want to pay the price. We don't want to pay the price. It might cost us more than we're willing to give. And we're not talking about just money either. That if we do it his way, it might cost too much. We might become frustrated with the waiting. We were talked about frustration. We might become frustrated with the waiting. We don't want to pay the price. We might be comfortable. We, no, we might be afraid it's going to make us uncomfortable or it might hurt. Because sometimes he, he requires of us to do things that in the natural we might not do on our own. But he knows where it will lead us to. And he says, do this. Why don't we understand? We don't always understand his ways. Sometimes... We're praying for this thing, and now over here, this other thing's happening. And we're thinking, well, that ain't got nothing to do with what I'm asking you for. But we don't understand that he's going to bring all those things together, and it's going to be the answer that we were looking for. We don't really believe what the Bible says. The truth is we don't. If we did, we would be stepping out of faith a whole lot more. Now, God is calling us to get in the word and to believe the word and act on the word and so we've got to get where we read it we understand it we see it and we uh, we are obedient to it and it will begin to shift us to trust the word if we could believe everything the word promises us we would be on a whole nother level but that's where God's calling us to he's calling us to that new level we think that trials and suffering is God not answering our prayers? You know, that's what we think. We think if I'm suffering or if I'm going through a trial, that means God's not answering my prayers. That God is not coming through. And the truth is, is in all these situations, the reason we don't trust God to come through is because of lack in us. It's our lack. It's our misunderstanding. It's our self-centeredness. It's not God's. He's not ignoring our prayers and not coming through for us. He is. It's our lack and our misunderstanding is the way we interpret that he's not coming through. Many people have fallen in this trap 
for generations after generations. Let's just talk about a few. Let's just start with the first two people, Adam and Eve. You know, they were listening to the wrong voice, weren't they? They began to listen to the wrong voice. They didn't follow God's instructions. You know, one key to getting God to come through is we've got to be obedient to what he tells us to do. If he tells you to do something, do it. But they weren't being obedient. They began to listen to the sort of voice that enticed them to go another direction. They were at a fork in the road with a forked tongue. But you know what? They could have stopped right there and they could have said, hold on, let's go consult God. If God tells you something and, and you come to a place and you hear hearing other things and, and maybe you're confused, don't act until you go back to God and get clear instructions. Because he will make clear the deception the enemy tries to bring us into. We have got to, when we get to these forks in the road, we've got to stop listening to the forked tongue, and we've got to start listening and going back to God. Amen. How about, and you know what? Whenever we do that, there's always a lot of consequences. We're all still looking at consequences from the first decision they're made. How about Abraham and Sarah? You know, Sarah laughed at God when he told her she's going to have a baby. You know, she's up in years, beyond the childbearing years. She didn't have the faith that God would actually do that. So they waited. Now, they did wait for a long period of time. But who says how long we should wait? We wait until God comes through. Now, I want you to know, I just want to stop right here and say this. I'm preaching to myself more than I am anybody out here. <laughs> so just know that. Okay? But what did they do? And this is where people like me, the fixers, get in trouble. Sarah said, let me help God out. So she come and has this master plan of Abraham and Hagar. And Abraham went along with it. And it created a problem we're still dealing with today. They should have just waited. Here's one we don't ever talk about too much. Job's wife. You know, we talk about Job, the man of perseverance. But we don't talk about Job's wife too much. And if we do, we kind of just say one little negative thing about her and we move on. Because what did Job's wife say? Job, you need to curse God and die. Just get it over with, get out of your misery, because God's not doing anything for you, basically. But you know what? We need to have a lot more compassion for Job's wife. Because let me remind you of a few things. Job's wife lost all her children just like Job did. Job's wife lost all her servants just like Job did. Job's wife lost all her livestock just like Job did. And Job suffered sores on his body and he's raking them with pottery, scratching them, trying to get some comfort. But Job's wife had to sit there and see her husband in pure misery, pure torture, broken down. And that affected her heart. And the truth is, it caused her to be angry with God. It caused her to give up on God for her to be able to say, curse God and die. But, you know, if we, how many of us have ever been angry with God? I have. Most everybody has been angry with God at some point in time. But it's important that we recognize that and we stop and we, and we, we have to trust what, that God is still in control. You know, she couldn't see the big picture. She didn't know the big picture. And, you know, even when God restores things, we still had to go through that suffering. She's, those children she had will never be returned to her. She'll see them in heaven. But God restored everything they lost. They had more children. They had more wealth. They had more servants. They had more of everything they had before. But it wasn't the same children. But, but sometimes we can't see what the big picture and that can cause bitterness in our hearts and she became fearful too I'm sure what's going to happen to me if Job doesn't make it you know here she is she's now would be a widow with no children and that's not a good place for a woman in that time so there's a lot of things sometimes that can cause us to think so let's go on. Let's talk about Moses. You know, Mo God told Moses to do a lot of different things, and he was very obedient to do most everything. But the one thing that caused Moses a lot of trouble is when Mo God told him to speak to the rock for water to come out of it, but he struck the rock, at, really, in, in frustration and anger. He was disobedient. 
And that disobedience cost him of going into the promised land. He didn't, he, his frustration blinded him to the bigger picture. King Saul went ahead and sacrificed rather than waiting like Samuel told him to do. He let the pressure and the fear of man, he let the pressure of the circumstances push him to do something he wasn't authorized to do. God was saying, through Samuel the prophet, wait on me. I'm the one authorized to do this. He wasn't even authorized to offer the sacrifices. Martha, at Jesus, to Jesus after Lazarus' death, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not be dead. Total disappointment in Jesus. Total loss of hope that he could have, what, you could have done this for me if you had just showed up. How many times have we felt that way? God, you could have done that. That was not a hard thing if you had just showed up on my behalf. But sometimes God has a bigger picture that he wants to do. And here, what brought more glory to God's name? That Lazarus get healed and, and not be sick and die? Or that Jesus would come days later and raise him from the dead back to complete health? God had a bigger picture, but we can't always see the end when we're in the middle of it. So what we have to do, we've got to go to God, and we've got to trust him with the, where we are at that time. And trust, I don't know where you're going to do with this. I don't know how you're going to do this, but I'm going to trust you in it, even if it looks really bad. And how much more worse could it have looked for Lazarus when that he had died? They didn't know that Jesus would bring him back from the death. So we've got to hold on. We are coming to a place in time in our lives. You know, we always need God. We always need God. We always need to seek God first. But if we believe the Bible, we're coming into times where we're going to see the glory of God manifested. And we're going to go through some difficult times in the future. We have got to be a people that no matter what it looks like, no matter what we're going through, that we just seek the Lord and we accept what he's doing, and we trust him to, to get us to the other side of it. To get, pr tr we trust him to get us through. Yeah. We've got to turn to God. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. We've got to maintain ourselves to be able to go through, to get to the other side of things. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. There's a lot of things we do not know. But if we seek God, he loves to unravel mysteries for us if we'll seek him and we'll ask him. So he might not give us the whole story, but he maybe he will give you enough to encourage you to hang in there, to hold on till you can see the end of the story. Truth is, we all face trials. We all face tests. But you know, Romans 8, 28 says that God works all these situations for our good. Out of every trial that we face, I'm sure that God is desiring for us to shift our dependence more on Him. He's looking for us to look to Him for help more than we did before the trial. For our answers and for our next step. We are promised victory. We are promised healing. We are promised peace, and we're promised provision, Amen. protection, and authority, and power. Amen. Those are promises to, he's made to us if we believe the word. Yes. But here's something else he's, always, he's already promised us too. And this might be a little bit harder to say amen to, but it's just as true. He's also promised us, he's granted us, he's gifted to us suffering. To participate in the suffering of Jesus and we're told that trials will come. That suffering is a gift to us because of what God does through it. He brings glory to his name. And he's always working good in us through it. Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but to also suffer for him. And we've got to embrace that there are times in our lives that are going to be difficult. And that those are just as godly as the times when things are just rolling smoothly. 
But during those difficult times, the key is to keep our dependence on him. Keep our eyes on him so that we're seeing victory through it and we get to the other side of it. And he's worked out in us and in the situations all that he wants to work out. But we got to embrace the trials. we got to embrace the suffering. We've got to embrace those things. The Lord says that they're gifted to us. They're granted to us. They're gifts just like every other gift is. Just like he promises us victory. He promises us healing. Jesus also suffered. And it says that we get to share in his suffering. We've got to begin to have a different perspective on what God, how God works. We've got to consider these as blessing and to receive them with joy. God requires us to go through trials and sufferings. He may lead us out sometimes, and when he leads us out of it, and then sometimes he walks with us through it. And you can look at examples in the Bible in both cases. Sometimes he just is there and walks you through it day by day, step by step. Sometimes he says, okay, I'm snatching you out of the fiery furnace, and I'm delivering you. Then there's times he says, I'll go with you by day and by night, but, and I'll be with you. But you're going to have to go through this desert. So they're, they're both true. We have to let God be the fixer, not us. We've got to have total dependence on him. Fixers like Abraham sometimes want to find solutions to their problems. But God is saying, look to me for the answer. Wait on me for the answer. Waiting on God's timing sometimes can feel torturous. But, if we, but it is a must that we really depend on him in every situation. He wants us to, give, to look to him for the solutions, the directions, the answers, the encouragement. And we need encouragement in these times, don't we? But he will give us that encouragement if we look to him. We don't need to be looking to our own intelligence. We don't need to be looking to our own strength. We don't need to be looking at our own independence and, and try to fix the problems ourselves. We don't need to be looking to our safety nets, yeah. not to ourselves. A key to learning to turn to the Lord for help is getting more word in us. You know, near the beginning of the year, I gave a word of the Lord for the year. And one element of that word is, is that God is saying that he wants the body of Christ to begin to dig into the word and begin to eat the meat. For too long, there's been just drinking milk. And God is saying, it's time to eat the meat because you're going to need the meat to build your strength up to be able to walk through the things I'm calling you to walk through. Because there's things for you to do. And it's not just about surviving. It's not just about getting to the end of our day. It's not just about making it through and, and feeling unscathed. It's about helping other people get to victory. It's about helping other people get up out of the pit and be able to walk alongside of us. It's about doing for others what we need done for ourselves and for them. It's about shifting our minds to get it off of us and get it on others and what God is saying to do. And that's part of what's been even talked about today, about you know, reaching our community. God is calling us to get the word in us so we got enough strength, we have enough wisdom, we have enough discernment that we can walk out here and we can be the body of Christ to people who don't even know who Jesus is. So he's calling us to move forward and to build up our strength. We can't lift heavy weights if we don't ever lift anything but a glass of milk. We've got to eat the meat of the word. We've got to shift our thinking and our responses. We've got to receive all with joy. The blessings, the gifts, the trials, the suffering. We've got to allow him to be our help. This is a shift in our hearts. This is a shift in our mind. But it's a shift that's required in us for us to get to be all that God's called each one of us as individuals to be. And it's a shift that's got to be in our hearts so that we can be the body of Christ to this city and this region that we're called to be. We got to take a shift that it's not about coming and being entertained. It's not about coming and being comforted. It's not about coming and getting ministry every time. It's about coming and getting equipped and fed and strengthened so you do the work of the ministry. So you bring in people and say so you're reaching people and touching people. It's about us getting strong. We've got to shift our thinking and our response. We've got to receive all of it. It's going to require a shift of how we think. And there's going to be times you're going to be halfway into response, including myself now. Again, I remind you, this is to myself. We're going to be halfway in our response to the Lord, and we're going to need to stop and turn around, asking to forgive us and say, 
That's not the right response. I look to you. I trust you to do what is needed. We must ask. If you need help, ask. We must ask. Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Let me read it to you. A, ask and it will be given to you. S, seek and you will find. K, knock and the door will be open to you. We've got to ask the Lord for help. We've got to seek him. We've got to ask him. If, you know, if we never ask him for something, how can we charge him and accuse him that he never did something for us if we don't ask him? But the word says that if we will ask that he wouldn't seek him and knock, it says in verse um, 9, which of you, if his son... No, I'm sorry, I skipped a verse. Skip verse 8. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. The question is, are we asking, are we seeking, and are we knocking? And do we stop after the first time, or do we keep on knocking? We need to keep knocking until we get our answer. We, keep, we need to keep asking until we see. We need to keep seeking him until we find him in whatever we're dealing with or whatever he's telling us to do. And he will answer us. We must know that God loves us and wants to help us. Matthew 7, 9 through 10. Which of you, if your son asks you for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you good gifts to those who ask him? The Lord is for us. The Lord loves us. Just like if you have a son or a daughter, you would not give them a snake if they asked you for something good. If they were hungry and they asked you for bread, you wouldn't give them rocks. God's better than we are. God is better than we are. He will give us what we need. We've just got to be open-minded and open-handed and say, God, this is what we're asking for. This is what I'm seeking. I seek you, and this is what I need. I need you to show me what I need to do, how I need to do it. Provide the way to do it. Show me, and I'll do it. And be willing, if it's difficult, to step into it anyway and be obedient to what he's saying. Obedient, you know, if we're asking him and we're seeking him and we're knocking and he tells us something, why would we not be obedient to do it? He's calling us to a greater level of obedience. We learn that God loves us, and we learn to trust him by knowing the truth, by reading and meditating on the word. That's a key one. Two, we have to spend time in his presence and worship him. Three, we need to be praying in our understanding. We know what to pray for. We know what we need. We need to be, what well, we think we do. We need to be asking him, and he can trust him to show us if we are off track. We got to ask. Ask, seek, knock. We need to be praying in tongues as well. When we pray in tongues, it builds us up in our most holy faith. It strengthens us. It activates our spirit, man, and makes us stronger. It's like lifting weights by your spirit when you're praying in tongues. We need to be praying in tongues all the time so that we can be strengthened and we can be in tune so that we can hear clearly. We can speak the truth. We need to be obedient to what he tells us, even when we don't see the big picture. And most often, you may not see the big picture. He doesn't reveal everything to us. He wants us to depend on him. So if he said, David, this is the big picture here. Now, this is where we're going to. Am I going to go through all the processes that he wants us to go through to get there? No, I'm going to be running to the end of the line, trying to get to the big picture. But he's got a process that he takes us through to get us to that big picture. So we've got to trust him to give it to us step by step and be obedient to take every step that he gives us. We've got to be thankful for all things, the blessings and the trials, because we benefit from both. We've got to remind ourselves in times of the times that God came through. We all have remembrance stones. God, you remember when God came through when this happened in our lives? Do you remember the time he healed our daughter of cancer? Do you remember the time that he straightened our son's leg when he was born with a crooked leg and he straightened it out so he could stop tripping? You've got to remember the times that God moved. 
you got to remember the times that where our runaway child came home and our family standing on the porch waiting on them. you got to remember the times that God does something special for you that only he can do. we got to remember those things. And when we're standing through whatever we're standing through, when we're waiting on whatever we're waiting on, when we're seeking him and we're looking for the next step, we need to receive it all in knowing that he loves us. Right. You know, God desires for this house to be, a, like was spoken earlier, a mighty warrior. Well, mighty warriors need strength. Mighty warriors need obedience. Mighty warriors need the word. Mighty warriors have to believe that God is moving in them and through them. And most of all, we've got to believe he's moving for us. We've got to trust him. We've got to trust him to get us to the other side. I appreciate you giving me a little extra time today. I I want us just to stand for a moment, if you will. There's a couple of things I want to say. I want to pray. First of all, everyone, if you will, just close your eyes for a moment. You know, I've been talking today about following the Lord. I've been talking about trusting the Lord. I've been talking about knowing that he loves us, knowing that we can trust him, knowing that he always comes through for us. But you know, none of that will matter to you if you don't know the Lord. If you don't know Jesus, I want to invite you today Just raise your hand if you don't know Jesus. Because that's the most important thing. we got to know him first. Anyone? Everybody's eyes closed? Praise the Lord. Everybody here knows the Lord. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you today. Father, we thank you that you are for us. Father, we declare today, we decree today, we trust you. We trust you with our whole heart. We trust you with our mind, our soul, our spirit, our body. We trust you. Father, forgive us when we've tried to fix things ourselves. Forgive us when we've tried to work it out ourselves. Forgive us when we've not trusted you or we've not been obedient to you. Father, we choose today. We choose today to come into alignment with you. We choose today to begin to do the things, and maybe we're doing them all, but we need to do more. But to do the things, Lord God, that will make us stronger, that will cause us to trust you more, that will cause us to have the right response, that will cause us to be obedient. For we ask you, Lord God, to help us in these things. Help us to embrace with joy every trial and every suffering that you say that we need to go through. And Father, we thank you in advance that you don't take that we don't go through that to live there. It's just a part of the journey to get us to where you want us. And that you're always with us. And that you always go before us and surround us. Amen. Lord God, we declare today, who does our help come from? Our help comes from you. Amen. Our help comes from you, Lord. And we thank you for that. I just ask you to say today, just repeat with me, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to thank all of you for coming today. We're going to have a team, if those that have asked will begin to come down, we're going to have a team down here to pray for people. If you have a prayer need, if you're seeking God about something and you want to see if God wants to say anything about it, come down and we'll pray for you. We'll minister to you however the Lord leaves. So if those I've asked for this week will come down, we will um, minister to you. I hope you have a blessed week. Remember, Wednesday nights, we have life group. If you would like to come, um, we live. you can call me or you can text pastor. And we can get you the address or ask us afterwards and be happy for you to come. I just want to bless all of you and thank you and pray that you have a blessed week and we will see you next Sunday. Thank you.